We're running a, little, a wee bit late. We're running a wee bit late. All right, good morning, good morning. It's good to have Benji, Amory, and Audrey here with us today. And it's also good to have Gracie's mum here with us today. Yeah, we've been praying for that. What a blessing. And uh, we're praying that uh, your mum gets you in order, sorts you out while she's here. All right. And uh, I think we've got uh, Sasha's back with us again, I think, today. I think I saw Sasha walk in here. Anyway, let's get started this morning. I might ask, uh, let me see, Brother Rod, would you open the Bible class in a word of prayer, please? Amen. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. All right, we are going to look at a doctrine this morning, the doctrine of Satan. We're not here to glorify him, but this is a, a doctrine in the scriptures. Uh, he is the enemy of all righteousness, isn't he? And if he's the enemy of all righteousness, he's the enemy of everything that God... He's the opposite of everything that God is. Okay, God is holy, God is righteous, God is just, he's all that, and, and Satan's the opposite. Uh, he's our enemy... All right, and it's important that we know our enemy. Now, isn't it interesting, like you go and try and find uh, pictures that portray the devil or whatever, and you always, you've got the ones with the horns, uh, or you've got the one all dressed up in red with the forked tail and the pitchfork and, and all of that. That's, that. That is so far from the truth when you think about it, and we'll look at some scripture this morning. Uh, but our, uh, our statement of faith is this, is that Satan is a person, the author of sin, and he and his angels shall be eternally punished. Woohoo! Hallelujah. And uh, that's going to be in the lake of fire, which we will, uh, which we'll see a little bit later on. All right. So we've got different names uh, of the devil here. We've different names of Satan. Of course, Satan. Satan. When you look at these, they're they're all like Satan means adversary too. But there are times in the Bible where it mentions our adversary. So we've got Satan, the devil, the adversary, dragon, serpent, deceiver, and angel of light. And uh, I tell you. Uh, I tell you, the angel of light is, is something that confuses and deceives a lot of people. Uh, there were some of us uh, in a, the former church at Heritage Baptist Church when we were there. We had a, uh, a young guy there. When I asked him his salvation testimony, his testimony was is that when he was at home, he saw an angel of light in the, in the, I think it was in the kitchen or whatever, and he believed that that was God and so on and so forth. And because he saw this great thing, he believed that that was the Lord. But then when I took him to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and said that Satan is transformed into an angel of light, that really opened his eyes up. And I'm glad, I'm glad that he received the Lord as his saviour when he saw the truth. But uh, we'll have a look at that verse of scripture a little bit later on as well. Uh, isn't it interesting how the movies portray and even glorify him? All right. So, uh, you know... Obviously, Hollywood, Hollywood, whatever you want to call it, you know what I mean? It's all run by uh, the wicked ones. So let's have a look at a... Who, who remembers what this film is? Someone shouted, oh yeah, was it? because we've seen it. This is Hellboy. This is Hellboy. You can see, ma- massive big picture. Uh, he's had the horns uh, cut off there. And in Hellboy, isn't he portrayed as a, a good guy or something? He's a, a fight, fighter of justice and all this sort of stuff. So, Hellboy, what about this one? Who's seen that film? <laughs> the Exorcist. Uh, the Exorcist. That was a pretty gruesome... That was, a tr- that was actually true events, as a matter of fact. But in the film, it was dealing with a little girl. But in real, real life, it was a, I think it was a 10-year-old boy in Canada um, that, that it took place. And it's interesting how it's always the Catholic priests that seem to be on the scene... And if you watch the films closely, they've got no power over any of anyone who's demon possessed, which is like go figure. Let's have a look at the next one that Brother Michael's gone to see. Michael Michael Ross has seen this one. <laughs> I'm not going to see it. Uh, the Pope's Exorcist with Russell Crowe. I won't have a hands up on who's seen that one. Uh, I watched it for um, for uh, educational purposes only. <laughs> I, no, but again, it's like, it's not, I don't know, it, it, it really, it, it glorifies the Roman Catholic Church, 
right? Because here you've got this guy. He's meant to be what they call the Pope's exorcist. The exorcist. He's the right hand, and he goes and deals with all these demon possessed, deals with the devil and all that. But he gets possessed. So if you're a, if you are a born again believer, I don't believe that you can be possessed of, the, of an evil spirit if you're born again in Christ, right? Because you've got the Holy Spirit that lives in you, and an unholy cannot dwell with holy, and vice versa. So you've got the Holy Spirit in you. How can an unholy evil spirit inhabit the same body? Uh, but again, it was a glorification, and uh, you know people love it. Uh, you've got other films like Constantine and things like that where they're dealing with all that sort of stuff. The world is enamoured with the supernatural. They just love the supernatural and the devil will give them what they want. And that's the thing about Satan, folks. The, the devil will give whatever you want. He'll give it to you. He, he'll want, he wants to deceive people. He thinks that he wants people to think that, that he's got it all and uh, that our Christian young people are missing out on so much stuff. It couldn't be further from the truth because he is a liar. He is a liar. All right, Oklahoma. Blessed old Oklahoma. Uh, you know, Oklahoma, when you think about America, uh, you know, the great bastion of Christianity, perhaps, you know, a Christian nation and that. And Oklahoma, you know, those southern states, the Bible Belt. It's interesting how that you see that a lot of this stuff. Now, I don't know, does anyone, has anyone seen this? Did anyone hear about this in Oklahoma? They set it up and uh, they've, they've set up a statue. It's what they call the Baphomet. All right. Now, if you look at this. You've got him sitting here, you've got the, the two kids that are looking up at him, just like, you know, as if a worship. You've got the, the pentagram over there. The only thing that actually that this picture doesn't portray is actually the Baphomet is half male, half female. All right, so they don't show that when they did this. So when you look at it from the top up, he's female and then male from the... So, you know, and then he's got his things and all of that. Let me tell you a little bit about the Baphomet. The Baphomet is a deity allegedly worshipped by the Knights Templar. Anyone heard of the Knights Templar? All right. That subsequently became incorporated into various occult and Western esoteric traditions. The name of Baphomet appeared in a trial transcripts for the Inquisition of the Knights Templar starting in 1307. So it's very interesting how that things are being put out there and being accepted. Uh, I think I mentioned this before. Has Satanism become an actual religion here in Australia? Yeah, I know Wicca is. It is. It's an actual religion. Uh, so I'm sure the devil loves that. And i tell you why, because he's always wanted to be worshipped. Uh, and this is now, remember, and we'll look at this a little bit later on, he had probably one of the most closest relationships or the closest proximity to God than any, any other angel, any of the created angels, uh, because he stood in the presence of God, radiating the glory of God in front of him, I would say, let me, reading on Isaiah 14, when we look at it in a minute, he, I reckon he was jealous. He saw all the worship that God received uh, and he wanted that. He's always wanted to be worshipped. Now, this is why he hates you and I as a Christian, because we worship the true and living God and he wants to be worshipped. When you look at the end times, you get into Revelation and that, we see how he wants to be worshipped. Uh, so he's going to have a short period of time where, uh, where he will be full on worship, but uh, even now... Uh, you see that. We mentioned one time before that the Church of Satan that was started in the 1960s in America, uh, immortalised by that song by the Eagles, Hotel California. That was about, uh, that was about uh, the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey, who wrote the Satanic Bible. Uh, high priests consisted of not just Anton LaVey, but one of the high priests was uh, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, was Jane Mansfield in that, Trace? Do you remember? Jane, Jane Mansfield was a high priestess. Uh, has anyone heard of Jane Mansfield? Jane Mansfield was an actor in the 1960s. She had an undignified ending to her life where her car crashed, went under a semi-trailer and it decapitated it. So he really looks after those that, he, that worship him. All right. So let's have a look at some... some, uh, some oh, yeah, I've got that up there. So we just read all of that. Next slide, please. All right, so you first fill in there. Number one, he counterfeits that which God creates. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We've got to remember that, that he is not a creator. He's a counterfeiter. Sasha, if you want to come sit in here, that's fine. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, all right. I just didn't want you feeling left out. Oh, good. So understand that, that God creates, right? We know that God is a creator. 
but Satan is the counterfeiter. And the reason being, the reason why he counterfeits all that God creates is because he wants to be known. It's like spiritual gifts. Everyone, well, not everyone, a lot of people get so worried about spiritual gifts and tongues and everything. But let me just tell you something. When you think about counterfeiting, or you know, you're counterfeiting money, it would be a little bit ridiculous to try and counterfeit something that's not in circulation. So if I, if I was a counterfeiter, let's say the Australian government took the $50 note out of circulation and then I come along trying to counterfeit the $50 note, you're soon going to be found out, right? So Satan's not going to counterfeit anything that's not already going. That's why he counterfeits the spiritual gifts. So when you think about spiritual gifts like, um, you know, like prophecy or word of wisdom, word of knowledge and, and all of those sorts of things... He counterfeits that by people who believe that they can read your future, those that uh, can, can reach over into the other side and all of that and tarot cards and, and all of that that people want to go to because people want to know what the future holds. They want to know what's going to take place. And so they run to these people that, that operate with the familiar spirits in their life to be able to try and deceive folks. All right, But we know that God is the true God. Only God knows the, the beginning from the end. Only God knows the future, folks. It, Satan can't. So let's have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse number 13. He says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So we see here that Paul knew very well about, uh, about Satan, false apostles, false teachers, and, and the, the closer to the Lord's coming, we're going to see so much more of that coming into play. Remember Jesus said false Christ, there are people that are going to come in and say I am Christ and this and, and false apostles, false prophets, false teachers. And this is, why, this is why you've got to know this front to back. Seriously. You've got to know this from front to back. You've got to give this time, you've got to study it, you've got to read it, let the Spirit of God guide you in it. Because this, the benefit, one of the benefits, there's many benefits to having a Bible, is that this, this, this is judged. This already judged between good and evil. This judges between what's right and what's wrong. And so by their fruits, the Bible says, in regards to false prophets, he said, you shall know them. So you use the word of God to judge to see whether what's going on is, is true. Uh, and so Satan is very good at tra transforming himself uh, into an angel of light. Like I said, He doesn't turn up with, forked, with, with horns and, and, a, and a pitchfork and a forked tail. And, uh, you know, that's not, how, that's not how he turns up. He'll turn up wearing a suit and tie so he can blend in or he'll, he'll turn up wearing board shorts and a singlet to fit in. He, he, will, he will manifest any way he so chooses to try and deceive people. All right? And that's why, that's why I believe this, one of the most important gifts, they're all important, but one of the most important ones is the discerning of spirits. All right? So you can discern the spirit of an, of an individual. And, uh, you know, I would like to think the older I get, the more, the more mellow I'm becoming. But I, I'm, not, I'm not putting up with anything in our church that has a wrong spirit. All right? I'm not putting up with that. And uh, I don't believe God wants to put up with that and God will deal with that. So secondly, he was defeated. Now, this we're talking about Satan. This is a great passage of Scripture. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Because he is defeated, and he was defeated by the Lord on the cross. That's why, now let me tell you, this is why Satan likes to have Jesus still on the cross. Now, if you, I, I like witnessing to all sorts of people, but I do like witnessing to those who are in different religions. And the, meaning, the reason for that is they have some sort of concept. They have a concept of, of God. Now, it's a wrong concept, but they have a wrong, they have a wrong But you can talk to those folks. And I've asked plenty of Roman Catholics before, I've asked them, I said, why is Jesus still on the cross? Because they've got the crucifix, Jesus is still on the cross in their churches, Jesus, because Satan wants Jesus still on the cross. And the reason why Satan wants Jesus still on the cross is because when, when Jesus went to the cross, died, was taken off, was buried and rose again, Jesus defeated Satan. So he doesn't want people to know that he's a defeated foe. 
And so therefore you ask these questions to these folks who are in different religions to try and get them thinking, well, Jesus is no longer on the cross. Or you say, why did Jesus go to the cross? And the, the Catholic might say, well, for our sins. Well, exactly right. Why did he need to die for your sins? And it's just a great opportunity to share Christ with people. If they don't receive it, they don't receive it. You've done what is right by sharing the gospel with somebody. All right? So let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Look at verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, that's Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So he didn't destroy death. That's the last enemy to be destroyed. But who did he destroy? He destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and, del and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So you notice something that, that, that Satan is a defeated enemy for us as believers. All right, And you need to know the scriptures dealing with this very truth because when he comes around, when he comes knocking on your door and he wants to try and defeat you, you need to know the scriptures and say, well, listen, Satan, this is what the Bible says. Jesus Christ already defeated you. You're a defeated enemy in my life. All right. Now, go with me to Colossians for a minute. I was reading this this morning, Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2. And it's amazing today when you think about, uh, you know, uh, knickknacks and things like that. A lot of people, and this is another thing too, if, if you're someone that likes to witness and talk to people and you come across a, a lady, perhaps more so a lady, and maybe she's got a crucifix around her neck, just a little, little one there, ask them, oh, I see you're wearing a cross. Do you know what the cross means? To, do you know what, what that's all about? Do you know what the cross means? And so on. And it's just a way of opening up an opportunity. Now, they might say, well, you know, it was given to me by my whoever and and then it's just an opportunity to say well let me tell you a little bit about the cross and what the cross is all about and why Jesus went to the cross and why he's no longer on the cross all right so we're in Colossians chapter 2 uh, let's have a look at verse 13 and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses hallelujah Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled, and that word spoiled means to strip, to take away from, and it's the idea of, of in the military where you've got someone who's of a rank, say a sergeant, and they're stripped of their rank and they're demoted to a private. They've had the authority taken away from them. And so that's what this word spoiled means. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, openly triumphing over them in it. And what is it? That is the cross. Okay. So in the life of a believer, when you look at the devil's been defeated, principalities and powers, which is the higher upper echelon of, of you know, Ephesians chapter 6, when you look at spiritual warfare, Jesus Christ spoiled them, he demoted them, he took authority away from them. And when we got converted into Christ, when we became born again in Christ, we now have his authority and principalities and powers and even the devil has no control over us because Jesus defeated him. But a lot of Christians really don't understand that and therefore they don't use the name of Jesus. They don't apply, if you please, the blood of Jesus. They don't use the word and we'll look at this in a moment but I'll jump ahead of myself. How did Jesus defeat Satan in the garden? Uh, not in the garden, in the wilderness. That's all he said. And he didn't go through a whole heap of scriptures. He just had one verse of scripture. When Satan tempted him in a certain area, he used a verse of scripture that pointed to what Satan was tempting him and he said, it is written. And one word from God will, will turn the temptation of Satan away. So that's how powerful the word of God is. All right. So we see here that he was defeated on the cross. Number three, he deceives others to do his dirty work. <laughs> Let's go to Revelation. Now, when we go to Revelation chapter 20, we know he's going to deceive the nations, right? Those that, that don't know Christ, they're already Christ rejectors. But, you know, he has a last-ditch effort. You know, for someone who supposedly knows the Scriptures, he's pretty stupid, right? 
I mean, come seriously. I mean, if, he, if he's going to know the Bible, and he does. I mean, he quoted scripture to Jesus, but he quoted it out of context, right? which is typical. Uh, but he knows the Bible, and if he was so brain, he knows his, he, actually, he knows his end if he, because if the Bible's there, right? He knows what's going to happen, but still he goes around deceiving people to try and get his dirty work done. So in Revelation chapter 20, where are we? Verse number 8. So when he's loosed after that thousand years, he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heavens and devoured them. What a, what a lightning show. Who, who, who enjoys a good lightning show? Wasn't it that storm the other night? I mean, the lightning that was going on. But I tell you what, when the fire comes down from heaven and destroys all these people, that's going to be one lightning show. Verse 10, And the devil deceived them and cast them into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So for all eternity, think about that, all eternity, he's going to be suffering and tormented in the lake of fire with the false prophet and where the beast is. So, you know, he, he deceives others to do his dirty work. That's why, you know, this is the thing. When you think about, when you think about people on earth, you've got, you've got God who, who saves those of us and, and he uses man to do his work, doesn't he? I mean, I'm grateful. Aren't you grateful that God would even consider me to do something for him, right? And it's a real blessing. So, you know, God's not going to come down to heaven to preach the gospel, but he wants to use you to do his righteous work. But Satan, what he wants to do is he deceives others to do his unrighteous work. And this is where the conflict is on earth. This is why you see the, the, the elites of the, the world and all of those in high places all they are, they're just puppets. It's all they are, they're just puppets. It's a spiritual warfare that's going on in the world today. All right. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 4 because the next one, as I said, he's, he's stopped in his tracks by the written word. By the written word. So let's go to Matthew chapter 4. And there's something very interesting that we learn about Jesus being in the wilderness. So he was there for 40 days and 40 nights and he was fasting. And if you notice that it was Satan came at the end of that 40 days when the Lord was at his weakest point physically speaking. He was at his weakest. I mean, I've not done a 40-day fast. I don't think I could as an incident. Has anyone here attempted a 40-day fast or anything like that? What's, what's the longest perhaps someone's faster? Tell me. What's Two weeks? Two weeks? Two days, two weeks, two days. Anyone else fasted a day or anything like that? If, you fa if you've ever fasted a day and you get to the end of the day, I mean, it's like the headaches and all of that. And well, You try 40 days. Now, I've only known a couple of, couple of guys that I know, pastors that have done 40-day fasts, and at the end of that 40 days, you're just so physically weakened. So, so we learn something about Satan. He's an, he's an opportunist, and he comes knocking when you're at your weakest. When you, you're weakest physically or emotionally or even spiritually, he'll come around. But even at your weakest, all you need is the word of God. You don't need to shout the word of God. You, uh, by the way, let me just say this. He can't read your mind. So you can't, you can't quote scripture in your mind to defeat the devil because he can't read your mind. You've got to put words to it. You've got to put your voice to it. That's what Jesus did, didn't he? He didn't say, try and read my mind, Satan, this is what I'm thinking. No, he said, it is written. All right, let's have a look at it there in uh, chapter 4. We won't look at all of the... Uh... Oh, by the way, by the way, all the points that Jesus was tempted, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And the three major areas, and it's the areas that Eve was tempted in, and, and First John tells us about that, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's the three major areas. Now, there's other under that. There's things that, but there are the three points. And Jesus was tempted in all points, but aren't you glad that he didn't succumb to temptation? All right, look at verse number one. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, I tell you what, um, if you're hungry... That's a big temptation. How many of you love chocolate? 
All right, how many of you sort of thought, okay, um, I'm not going to have any chocolate, but then at night time, you think, oh, gee, I wouldn't mind a uh, cup of tea or a glass of milk with some chocolate. And you can hear, can't, listen, temptation's got a voice. The chocolate that's in my fridge, fridge, it speaks to me. It speaks to me. It says, just take a slice. Just take a bar of this fruit and nut. <laughs> Okay, yes, I'm there, you know what I mean? Like just one bar, I tell you. Oh, t- so what I'm saying is this, is that here's Satan tempting Jesus at his weakest point. He hasn't eaten anything. He's hungry. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And of course, that's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. All right, so we won't read through all of that, but you look at the temptations, verse 7, it is written, Okay, uh, verse number 10, uh, for it is written. And so what I'm saying is, is that you and I, when he comes and tempts us, because for us as believers, the temptation is very real. Temptation's not the sin. Did you hear me? Temptation is not the sin. It's yielding to the temptation that produces the sin. So when he comes tempting you, 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 you cut him off at the pass. You nip it in the bud. You say, hang on, I'm being tempted with chocolate. Oh, man, shall I not live by chocolate alone? You know but you know what I mean, all right? You take a verse of scripture that speaks to the situation. By the way, let me go here. Oh, oh that pulpit. <laughs> now I've got to bend down, Michael. <laughs> oh, gee. All right, let's go to, uh, here we are. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm 54 years old and can hardly move. <laughs> Sad, I know. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. We know Ephesians chapter 6 because of the, the context of spiritual warfare. But I want you to notice something in verse number, uh, verse number 17. Paul says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All right? The Word of God. Now... Uh, in the Greek, there's two Greek words for the word word, logos and rima. Logos speaks of the written word, but rima speaks of the, the spoken word. Okay? It also has the idea of this word here, the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It, it means this, it means to take a scripture that speaks to the situation and apply it. So if you're struggling, let's just say you're struggling with finances, you just, you've got a bill coming up and I just don't have the money, you don't go and quote, uh, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit for they, shall be, for they shall inherit the kingdom, right? Because that verse doesn't say anything about what you're struggling with. So if you're struggling with, say, finances and paying the bill, you go to verses like Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, but my God shall supply all, all, that, all you need. Uh, you go to Psalms where David says... Uh, I, am, I have been young and now I'm old and I've not seen the righteous forsaken. All right. So you take a verse. This is what the sword of the spirit is. It's not just a. It's not just a pluck a verse out of out of uh, out of the Bible and say it because Jesus was very specific in what verses he used and he and he used the verse that spoke to the situation and that's what the word of, that's what the sword of the spirit being the word of God is all about. Taking a verse of scripture that applies to the situation. Okay. So whatever the temptation is, you, that's why you need to know the Bible. Amen? Okay. All right, let's go to uh, the next one. The next one, he is to be resisted. Now, we spoke a little bit about this last week. All right, remember that? Last week we talked about resisting. Uh, James chapter 4, let's go there. James chapter 4, we looked at this. And then First Peter. I haven't got my watch, so someone tell me what time it is. Oh, that's right. Okay. Just go like this. Finish. James chapter 4. Verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Now tell you what, we don't want, to, we don't want God to resist us, right? And uh, anyway, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. That's the first thing. That means to voluntarily humble yourself. Now... James talks about it and so does Peter where he says, humble yourself. 
Now, I, would, I don't know about you, I would rather humble myself than have God humble me. <laughs> I won't ask for a show of hands, but has anyone had God humble them before? I tell you. I wish I had learned the first time, but, you know, I'm just... So he says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let me just say, you can only resist him once you've humbled yourself under God. Because you need the strength and the power and the grace of God to help give you the strength to resist. But notice he says, if you resist, he will flee. He will. That's a promise. All right, that's a promise. Verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll see it again here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse number 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. All right? So it's very important that we, uh, that we resist him. All right? We've got to resist him. We humble ourselves under God. Now, notice what he says in verse number, uh, uh, let me see, verse, verse 7. He says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. That's the thing, folks. Let me tell you, your adversary is the devil, not the person sitting next to you. Your adversary is not your husband or your wife. Your adversary is not a family member. Your adversary is the devil. All right, We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And watch this verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and he gives us the strength, the grace, the ability and we resist him steadfast in the faith. The faith of what? The faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you believe that Jesus defeated Satan on the cross? This is what he's talking about. You've got, to, you've got to know the significance of what Christ has done for us in our life. All right, number next one. All right, we know this. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Now, you would think that we would know this. His modus operandi is to get us to doubt God's word. And you think, oh, well, but you know, there's still many Christians today who doubt God's word. Amen. And uh, I'm talking about the word that you have in your lap. And you've got to ask yourself the question, and I'm not going to get on uh, you know, Bible versions or anything, but you do have to ask yourself the question, why so many Bible translations, why so many Bible versions, and why are they, why are they so significantly different one from another? Uh, you know, you just... Hey, I, I remember in Bible college, we did, a, we did a, a course on the Word of God and we had a, a typed out message and the typed out message was called logic, logic Defines or Logic Proves the King James Bible, you know. You've got to, again, you've got to ask yourself the question, why is this always attacked? I mean, why? And this is the thing, when you look in the end times where you look at, even John was, was on the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God's sake, right? And I've said this before, and you may disagree, but, that, you know, we're going to be... I, I believe this, is that persecution will come to the believer because of the Bible. The, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the right Word of God, the true Word of God. Because when you look at some of these other versions, they're not really, they're not really uh, dogmatic in their approach. You know, you read some of these ones, and it's like, oh, well, it could mean this, it could mean that, it's okay with this. But again, look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. And that's it right there. Hath God said. That little seed of doubt. That little seed of doubt. Now, you know, it's interesting that most Christians, when you say, Oh, do you hear from God? So, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know if I've heard from God at all. But you ask them, they, they can name, Oh, yeah, but Satan come around and he starts to... I think Christians hear more of the voice of the enemy than what they do with the voice of God. Or they just don't know how to discern between the two. The voice of Satan will always cause doubt. And remember this, he cannot tell the truth. He doesn't tell the truth. John, Jesus said that in John chapter 8. He's a liar. So when he comes around and he starts talking to you from, about stuff, he's either trying to cause doubt or he's lying to you. And so again, you go to John chapter 8 and you say, Devil, you are the father of lies. Get away from me. You know what I mean? So this is what he's always tried to do. Cause 
people to doubt what God has said. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said, and again, we go on down through that, and uh, the fall of man. All right? The author of sin was Satan, and he came around and he deceived. And, uh, yeah, terrible. Doubting God's word. Don't doubt God's word. God, God never lies. God never lies. Uh, he's, it's impossible for him to lie, the Bible says. So therefore, you can always rely on the truth, the promises of God's word that he gives to you. All right, let's have a look at the next one. All right, he craves to be worshipped. All right, he craves to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped. He sees how God worships. All right, he sees how God worships. Uh, we won't look at all of this. Let's just go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah. If you go to Ezekiel, you'll see that he is the cherub and, you know, he's uh, one of the, I believe he was one of the three archangels. Anyone else believe that? I mean, you've got Michael and Gabriel and Lucifer. They were the three archangels. And each one of those, if you think about it, the three archangels, you had Michael who was the warfare, if you please. You always see Michael engaged in warfare. What do you see Gabriel always doing? Message. Bringing a message. So he's, he's, he's the archangel of the word, all right? So you've got warfare, you've got the word. And what was Lucifer uh, in charge of? Music or worship, all right? So again, you've got the Trinity, you've got the three in one, you've got, you've got warfare, you've got the word, and you've got worship, okay? And so Satan was the, uh, what they call the heavenly song leader, I guess, is what they, what they say. And you know, when he fell and was corrupted, everything about him was corrupted. Now, he was created with musical instruments in him, wasn't he? And so therefore, when you think about music, I love music. Anyone else love music? I love music. And uh, isn't it interesting, you know, you think about uh, maybe a, a secular song that you haven't heard for such a long time and, and you thought, oh, well, and, but you go into the supermarket and it's played over the, over, the, over the loudspeaker or whatever and next thing you know, you've just picked it straight up. You know, you say, oh, what, am I, what am I doing singing about that? You know what I mean? They're so powerful. Music is powerful. And uh, I can't stand the doof doof music though. <laughs> I don't know how anyone can listen to that. <laughs> All right, where are we? We digress. Go to verse number 12. Verse 12. Oh, it says so much. We don't have time. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Wow. So, you know, he does crave. He wants to be exalted. We see that. Um, you know, you go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 where the Antichrist wants to set himself up as God, to, to be worshipped as God and, and all of that. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting too when you think about it, because I'm reading through Acts and you look at Revelation, where when Peter gets to Cornelius' house, Cornelius falls down basically to worship him. And Cornelius said, stand upright, I, I'm also a man, don't worship me. And then in Revelation, John says the same thing. John, John falls down at the angel's feet to worship him. And the angel says, don't, don't worship me. I'm of your brethren, the prophets. So it's, it, it, worship in society is a big thing. Man wants to be worshipped. Satan wants to be worshipped. Now, we are worshippers. And who should we be worshipping? We should be worshipping Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, right? So it's, it's all in the world as far as what worship is. So it's a powerful thing. All right, let's close with this. We, we looked at Revelation 20.10 already. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. We saw in Revelation 20.10, we saw his end. I don't know how many times I've listened to preach and everyone's like, man, I want to be there when he's thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, you know, when I see him go in there, I, I don't know how it's going to play out. You know, I don't know what I don't know whether the Lord's going to get everyone together around and say, "Okay, watch me, uh, watch me throw him into the lake." I don't know, but we know what his end's going to be. All right, his destiny is the lake of fire. 
So Matthew 25 and uh, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. All right. So the lake of fire, the false prophet and the beast is there also. Uh, but notice, notice something too, that, that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. All right. It wasn't prepared for man. Now here's the thing. God being a just, what time is it? God being just and holy and righteous, sin has to be judged, which is why Christ went to the cross. Right? Jesus judged us, Jesus was judged, our sin was placed upon him, it was on the cross, that's where he dealt with it. He he doesn't I don't believe that the Lord wants anybody to go to hell. And our responsibility is to share the gospel with people to warn them about that. Now, we know that not everyone's going to receive it. That's a sad fact. But we still warn people about that. So even the the very grace, the very nature of God is he doesn't want people to go there. It's been prepared for the devil and his angels. And aren't you glad that that's where he's going to end up? Not going to go about deceiving, tempting anymore. Man, it's going to be a great day when that takes place. Amen? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, we thank you that, uh, that though uh, Satan is real, we know that you defeated him, Lord, and we're so thankful for that. And Lord, through you, through your word, we also can have victory in our life as well. So God, bless our fellowship time now and the service in time to come in Jesus' name.